Uh, Peter, how is the uh, spring in Singapore? Uh, it's it's like every other time of the year. It's, uh, it's hot, humid, occasional rain. Uh, so so uh, not much difference. You experienced it. Yeah. And how is the how is the COVID now? Um, there, there's been a small uh, surge, um, uh, uh, and I think they've uh, got it under control. Uh, it's small in the sense that uh, instead of having uh, one or two a day. Uh, we've been uh, getting a few uh, clusters uh, which have brought it up to maybe, I think, about five a day. Uh, now it seems to be coming down. Uh, so this is uh, a, a problem which you uh, cannot be complacent. You cannot uh, take your eye off the ball. Uh, once you do, you're going to have problems. Uh, so uh, the authorities are being extremely careful. I see. Uh, but but that's the second way. Are, yeah, but things are being helped okay. because uh, the vaccination program is uh, fully underway. Uh, so I, I, I think that's going to make a huge difference. Okay. So no, I, I, I think we can start now, yes. Okay. Good morning, colleagues, um, the participants and the attendees. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Sonjo Kujo. I'm going to be the facilitator for this webinar for this morning. And we are going to be having a masterclass. And that is a, the topic is the challenges of governance in a complex world. Building bureaucracies that think ahead, manage uh, black swans and effectively deliver on national development priorities, as well as um, making sure that governments continue to function. And from the South African side, we are also looking at a, a number of participants that are going to take place in this uh, um, a webinar. Some of them that are registered are ministers, and we hope we can have a few of those that are attending today. Um, otherwise, we also have a number of our heads of departments that are going to be attending, whether it is from the provincial level, national level, um, uh, GGs. And then we also have the state-owned entities and municipalities um, from South Africa. The heads of those entities will also be uh, participating. And what is going to be of interest today is that we are going to be joined by uh, Mr. Peter Wo, who is going to uh, share experiences that we can see whether we can learn from as South Africa the experience of Singapore. I think that they are well known for having done very well in a number of uh, areas. Um, we will also uh, in the program later on after Mr. Uh, Peter has presented uh, the masterclass, which will take a, about 40 to 45 minutes. We'll then request our DG in the presidency, Ms. Uh, Pindile Baleni, um, who will be a respondent. And then we will then um, also, after that, we'll ask Mr. Uh, Peter Ho to actually look at a, a number of questions that would have been posed and, and, and probably respond to a few. And then we will then, at the end of it all, then we will, we will close. I would then, uh, before I move forward, uh, to say that uh, in today's world, we live in a very constantly changing environment, uh, be it in the area of technology, security, 
and then also issues such as extremism, uh, cyber issues, and um, it becomes very interesting to see how we respond to those ones. Do they find us already geared up, having anticipated what is going to happen? And these phenomena present on their own, uh, their own set of complexities. What does this all mean for all the policymakers, to government, to bureaucrats? Are we able to adapt ourselves with all these changes uh, when they bring um, different situations to us? Are we able to confront them head on, head on and deal with the challenge? Or we are even scared to actually adapt to the new situations as they present themselves? And then of course, uh, as I had mentioned earlier on, we live in a complex world, political systems that are forever changing and, um, and our need for us to be able to adapt to that. And uh, why do we sometimes get surprised when things don't go the way we had anticipated? Do we just withdraw and go back to our shells or we, or, uh, we take measures that are needed to, to chatter the way forward? Can we still, rely on policies to be the appropriate response to some of the situations. And I think that one of the recent developments has been the one of COVID-19. And I think that for many governments, it has shown how some have been found wanting and not ready to deal with that and in, and for a variety of reasons. And there are lessons to be learned from this. And we are hoping that with some of those, there are lessons that we can take forward as we move along to deal with these issues. I wouldn't even uh, want to uh, take much more time because uh, we only have a little over an hour and 15 minutes to deal with all these issues. And then without wasting much time, I would request um, uh, that uh, uh, Kulam um, uh, shows us on the screen the profile of Mr. Peter Ho. Um, I hope that we can leave it there on the screen for a bit so that we see the credentials of the person who's going to present. Needless to say that he has spent 34 years in the, in, in, in the public service. He has served in foreign affairs. He has been with intelligence. He has been also with department, uh, with defense. And this alone, it tells you and the number of diverse issues Mr. Peter Ho would have dealt with. And on that note, I would like to welcome Mr. Peter Ho. Um, and before I give to Mr. Peter Ho, I would request our principal, uh, Mr. Busani Ngaweni, to welcome us to the masterclass. Mr. Ngaweni, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Secretary for Defense, uh, Ambassador Sondo Kujo, good morning to you as our facilitator today. Good morning to our guest, Mr. Peter Ho, a fellow of the Civil Service College, and as well as uh, DG Pindivaleni, DG in the presidency and the Secretary of Cabinet. Good morning to everyone who's attending here. I see a number of ministers, MECs, heads of departments national and provinces and other senior uh, managers. We welcome you to the NSG masterclass. This masterclass today is important because a week ago, we entered into an MOU with the Civil Service College of Singapore. Uh, it's very good for us as a National School of Government to work with those who've walked this path before and they've mastered the art of uh, delivering quality training programs and build capable bureaucracies as the Civil Service College has done. So we're very excited to have this as a start just a week after signing the MOU. As you are aware, we are running a series of masterclasses where we get eminent people like Peter Ho to come and make these uh, kind of presentations to open up conversations between those who are leading the stage, whether they are elected or appointed. And as you know, we've had students, including the president uh, of the Republic attending our, our, our masterclass. So Peter, we, we've got very you know, senior members of the executive here, as well as senior managers as part of the bureaucracies as the NSG, we are opening up 
a conversation um, you know, between leading experts as well as uh, those who are leading public service. We've had a number of other master classes uh, as well uh, before. As the NSG, this is part and parcel of our continuing leadership engagements. We've got exciting flagship programs. We see very senior and diverse audiences attending our, our classes. So hopefully some of you as you leave this masterclass today, you will be registering for a course at the NSG uh, this, uh, this afternoon. We're doing most of our courses virtually like this masterclass because we can reach people in Singapore as we are doing now and we can reach public servants all over uh, the country at a very limited uh, you know, cost. Partnerships are the future for us. These are some of the partnerships we are delivering training programs with internationally. Locally, in two weeks' time, we are signing 10 MOUs with 10 universities in addition to the five who are already co-creating or co-delivering programs uh, with, uh, with us. So thank you to everyone for being here and thank you, colleagues, and we look forward to a, a fruitful engagement. Back to you, uh, DG. Thank you very much, Mr. Naweni. And I will now turn it over and I will now invite uh, our main presenter, Mr. Peter Ho. Um, he's going to have 40 to 45 minutes to take us through um, his presentation. Mr. Ho, you are welcome, and we wish you um, um, a, a good uh, interaction with the participants that are going to be here. We will invite a few of them to ask questions uh, at the end of this, and I give the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me see. Uh, you have, uh, can you see my screen? That's the most important thing. Not yet. You can't see my screen. Something has happened. Okay. Uh, share. You can see it now? Yes. We can see that now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to speak at this uh, master class. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how we navigate in a complex world. And uh, you will realize by the end of the presentation that I've uh, probably raised more questions than I've provided. Uh, answers, but that's the very nature of the kind of world we uh, live in. And the world we live in uh, uh, is a complex uh, world, uh, as Ambassador uh, Sonto uh, mentioned in her remarks. Huh? Uh, but uh, one of the things uh, we have to uh, understand about that complex world is everything is connected to everything else. Huh? Uh, this is an observation which uh, various thinkers over uh, millennia have uh, uh, observed. Everything being connected to everything else. Uh, Lenin said this. Leonardo da Vinci uh, mentioned this uh, during the Renaissance. And 3,000 years ago, the famous uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu uh, made the same uh, point. Uh, and uh this uh for for a lot of reasons which perhaps we can discuss later on uh, uh stephen hawking who is the uh, famous theoretical physicist said that the 21st century will be the century of complexity so we use terms like uh, uh you know we live in a complex world the 21st century will be the century of complexity what do we really mean by this uh it's uh, very simple to say that the world is complex, but uh, on the other hand, uh, what is the real uh, uh, context and uh, attributes of complexity? I would say the most uh, important of the attributes of a complex system, a complex world, is the property of uh, emergence. And what does that mean? Imagine that uh, you are in a city. A city is definitely a complex system. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people living in a, a city. Uh, each of them, each uh, person living in that city uh, behaves uh, in a way that is uh, often unpredictable. Sometimes their behave, individual behaviors are hidden from view. 
but the collective uh, behaviors uh, lead to the property of emergence, which is uh, the aggregate behaviors uh, 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 often uh, in total uh, unpredictable. And that's what leads to surprise. And this is the property of emergence. In other words, you only know it when you see it. And that's the property of uh, surprise. And uh, of course, there are uh, categories of surprise. The big ones, of course, are uh, surprises like black swans. And uh, I think most of you would have heard of uh, the term black swan, which was coined by Nicholas Nassim uh, Talib, uh, who wrote the book, The Black Swan. And black swans are rare, hard to predict events with a large uh, impact. But there are other types of uh, 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 surprises. And uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, not long after the 911 attacks, uh, spoke about uh, uh, a close relative of the black swans, which are the unknown unknowns. But let me uh, uh, quote him in total, because this, these are very important uh, concepts uh, in a complex world. Uh, and he said this, there are known knowns. These are things we know we know. We also know that there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know that there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And these uh, uh, concepts of known knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns are actually uh, very important concepts if we want to understand uh, the kind of world which we are operating in. And we're going to be surprised from time to time by known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And let's just uh, uh, take a tour of some of the big surprises which uh, we've experienced in uh, the last few uh, decades. And we can debate whether they are known knowns, known unknowns, unknown unknowns of black swans, but they were big surprises. Huh? Uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, 1991, Asian financial crisis, 97, 98, the uh, 911 attacks in 2001, uh, the SARS outbreak in November 2002, it lasted till about uh, mid-2003, uh, then the global economic and financial crisis of 2008-2009. Um, Brexit, uh, 23rd June 2016. And not long after that, the US presidential elections uh, at the end of uh, 2016. And then most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, started sometime in December 2019. Uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Sonto uh, said that, uh, you know, we are uh, constantly surprised by change. And the founding Prime Minister of uh, Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, said this, the past was not preordained, nor is the future. There are as many unexpected problems ahead as there were in the past. So uh, societies are changing. Uh, Singapore society is changing. I imagine that uh, society in South Africa itself is changing, especially since the end of apartheid. Uh, and more than that, it's not just society changing. Uh, people are getting better educated. But with uh, uh, changes in society with better education, expectations also change. And I think uh, all of you will be familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of uh, needs. Uh, Abraham Maslow was an American psychologist who developed this idea of a hierarchy of needs. Governments tend to be uh, focused on uh, providing the basic needs, uh, which is food, shelter, uh, uh, jobs, uh, security, law and order. But ironically, when governments deliver on uh, uh, the basic needs, uh, people take those for granted and then they start to worry about uh, issues which are further up the hierarchy. 
including uh, needs like their cognitive needs, their aesthetic needs, uh, self-actualization and transcendence needs. And un unfortunately, uh, governments are less well placed uh, to meet these needs because these needs are the needs of the individual. And government policies are, are really focused on meeting the needs of uh, groups of people rather than the needs of uh, uh, individuals. Uh, so this is the challenge of uh, 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 rising expectations. And when we, sorry, and when we have rising expectations, you know, uh, people not only uh, because of better education want jobs, they want jobs with uh, the pay that goes along with it. Uh, there's another challenge which uh, is a, a more recent phenomenon, and that is uh, the world we live in today is uh, very much dominated by the social media. And the social media, uh, ironically, the social networks, which were meant to uh, unify communities, are also being used to uh, split societies. And in 2016, uh, the Oxford Dictionaries uh, said that the word of the year, every year they come up with a different word of the year. But in 2016, they said uh, the, the, the word of the year was post-truth. Uh, and in the post-truth world, objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than emotional appeals and personal beliefs. So this is a, a new world we live in, a post-truth uh, world. And uh, we, we see, of course, the phenomenon of uh, fake news and uh, you know how uh, people are beginning to believe in conspiracy theories, even when there's not necessarily any evidence to back this up. So the phenomenon of uh, conspiracy theories uh, pushed by groups like QAnon which uh, started in the US, but now appear to have spread to, uh, to Europe, uh, is something that I think is going to create a lot of challenges for uh, government. Uh, resulting in uh, uh, a, a problem, trust is in crisis. Uh, and this is the Edelman Trust Barometer, which uh, does uh, surveys of trust around the world. And for the first time in 2017, they headlined their report, Trust is in Crisis Around the World, noting that the general population's trust in four key institutions, business, government, NGOs, and media, has declined broadly. That means around the world, in total, it's less than 50% the trust in these key institutions. And this problem of uh, declining trust uh, has continued since uh, since 2017. In 2021, the, Edel the latest Edelman Trust Barometer uh, shows that uh, 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 trust is generally still in decline. Uh, and uh, you, you'll see, of course, uh, South Africa is, uh, 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 I've highlighted uh, South Africa, but uh, they noted that uh, uh, trust has declined in the US, in, in China, uh, and, and elsewhere around the world. Uh, and that's a real problem because if people don't trust their governments, how do governments uh, operate? This seems to be almost like a secular trend. Now, uh, when I talk about change, I'm not just talking about uh, change as a velocity. Uh, I'm talking about uh, change as an acceleration. Uh, if you, uh, you may have heard of the, uh, something called the Great Acceleration. It's an uh, empirical uh, observation that uh, things have accelerated since the end of the Second World War, actually since the 50s. And you can uh, pick this uh, uh, dashboard uh, off uh, uh, Google if you Google it. And uh, I've just taken uh, a, a part of uh, a much larger dashboard and I've chosen the socioeconomic trends and the ecological trends. And if you notice, uh, everything has uh, started to accelerate uh, since the 50s on the socioeconomic 
trends. It's not just the world population that has accelerated since the 50s. Uh, GDP has grown. Uh, uh, energy use has uh, accelerated. Water use has accelerated and so on. But on the negative side of the ledger, the, the, the ecological uh, trends, uh, carbon dioxide release has uh, accelerated, methane release, surface temperatures, ocean acidification, and so on, all accelerated since uh, the end of the Second World War. So this is uh, uh, something that is unique to this period of uh, our history, acceleration. Uh, on technology, uh, many of you would have heard of Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's law is uh, an empirical law which observes that computing power uh, doubles about every uh, two years, and that's an acceleration. And uh, since this uh, uh, observation was uh, made uh, in the 50s, uh, indeed, uh, computing power has been doubling about every uh, two years. And with this uh, computing uh, power doubling, a lot of technologies which depend on computing power, which depend on semiconductors, have also been changing at that accelerating uh, pace. Uh, Tom Friedman, uh, who won the uh, Pulitzer Prize twice, I think, huh? uh, he wrote a book very recently called Thank You for Being Late. And uh, he subtitles it an optimist guide to thriving in an age of accelerations. And in this book, he refers to the simultaneous accelerations in technology, globalization, and climate change, all interacting with one another. Two, two words I'd like to highlight, accelerations and interacting. So technology, as I mentioned, is accelerating, but climate change, I, I showed the great acceleration, the ecological accelerations, globalization also accelerating, but more importantly, they're interacting with one another. And because they are interacting with one another, they are uh, producing outcomes that are very hard to calculate and essentially unpredictable. This is the property of uh, emergence. And this is the uh, challenge of uh, accelerations. Uh, if you are in the business of government living in a world of accelerating change, what's the implication? Your decision cycle is shortening. There's much less time to collect data. There's much less time to understand what that data means. And then there's much less time to make uh, sound decisions. And finally, less time to execute those uh, decisions. So uh, governments are under constant pressure. There's no luxury to sit and wait and uh, collect data, to analyze that data, and then to make the decisions. You just got to make uh, decisions essentially on the fly. Uh, another issue I'd like to uh, point out uh, is the issue of our cognitive biases. We have cognitive biases, we have blind spots. All human beings, uh, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of them have uh, cognitive biases and blind spots. And uh, one of these uh, 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 cognitive biases uh, is something I describe as the black elephant. Uh, the black elephant is a cross between the black swan, which we discussed a bit earlier on, and the elephant in the room, which is a problem which is uh, there, which is obvious to everyone. Uh, but then uh, we pretend that uh, we, we ignore it. Uh, we, we, we prefer that the problem didn't exist. And of course, uh, hoping that nothing will happen during our watch. But when it happens, uh, we, we, we pretend as if it was a black swan but the problem was always there. That's the black elephant. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the black elephant isn't an endangered uh, species. Huh? By the way, there's no such thing as a real black uh, elephant. I think these uh, elephants in this uh, photograph have been painted black. I don't know why. Um, 
I think Ambassador uh, Sonto said that uh, uh, COVID-19 was a black swan. Uh, actually, I don't think uh, uh, the coronavirus was a black swan. I believe it was a black elephant in this sense. Uh, in the last century alone, never mind going back uh, a, a few hundred years in, and thousands of years into things like the Black Plague and so on. In the last century alone, uh, we have experienced uh, a few pandemics, including the Spanish flu of uh, 1918, then the uh, Hong Kong flu in uh, the 50s, and we had a few uh, near brushes with pandemics, including uh, SARS in 2003, the H1N1 uh, bird flu, uh, MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome, and then Ebola. Uh, all these should have uh, been uh, warnings to the world uh, that uh, uh, we are constantly at risk of uh, 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 a very uh, serious contagion. Uh, yet, uh, you know, the world was uh, appeared to have been caught by surprise when uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, burst on the scene, uh, first in China in December 2019, then spread rapidly to the rest of the world. Was it a black swan or was it a black elephant? Well, we can debate this for quite a long time. But at any rate, the world was uh, surprised. And we are, in a sense, paying the price today for this uh, surprise because we were all caught woefully unprepared. Uh, Margaret Heffernan, uh, who wrote two wonderful books called Willful Blindness and Uncharted, uh, said that we have, over the last 100 years at least, very much fallen in love with the idea that human life is uh, predictable. But of course it isn't. We cannot predict. How do we plan as a government uh, for a future that is inherently uh, unpredictable? Uh, if you cannot predict, uh, then you have to use other tools. And one of them is uh, uh, scenario planning. And of course, in South Africa, you're uh, well familiar with the famous Mount Fleur scenarios, which I think came out in 1992. And part of this exercise is, you know, about identifying uh, driving forces, uh, looking for disruptive trends, uh, searching for weak signals. And then it's about uh, telling the stories to try to tease out the very complex meanings of what all these uh, weak signals, uh, emerging uh, trends, and driving forces mean. And let's just go through an exercise to try to uh, uh, see, you know, some of the kinds of uh, trends, weak signals, and driving forces which uh, we should be worried about. And I'll be taking you on uh, uh, quite a uh, 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 meandering tour uh, but let's start with uh, technology. What does automation and robotics uh, uh, mean? Uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, how does that impact on the future of jobs? And, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics are happening around the world, and they are going to affect the future of jobs. And will it lead to more joblessness in uh, countries around the world, in countries like South Africa and Singapore? These are uh, trends we have to watch. And with uh, rising unemployment, and unemployment, as I understand it, is uh, high in South Africa, uh, there's a lot of youth unemployment, and this will lead to uh, growing inequality. And then, uh, the consequences of uh, inequality, joblessness, uh, will be a phenomenon which uh, all governments worry about, uh, the rise of uh, xenophobia. And even civil unrest, uh, you can think about the uh, Hong Kong protests in 2019. These were arguably the result of a lot of inequality uh, within, uh, within Hong Kong. 
uh, and then let's turn to climate change. The world is uh, uh, undergoing uh, climate change, despite what the climate deniers say. Uh, I think climate change is here to stay. And unfortunately, the world is getting both hotter, it's getting wetter and drier at the same time. Uh, last year was among the top five hottest years on record. Uh, and it's not just getting uh, hotter, uh, but some parts of the world are getting too hot for human beings to live outside a, uh, an artificial environment, in other words, an air-conditioned environment. And the scientists say that there are some parts of India, some parts of the Gulf, and even some parts of Africa, which will in, essentially become uninhabitable unless you are uh, rich enough or you can afford to have an air-conditioned uh, home. So this is a, a problem that is looming over the horizon. Uh, and then this could lead to a uh, 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 phenomenon like the day zero problem, which was, I understand, a, a near-death experience for Cape Town. Uh, and then issues like uh, food insecurity. Uh, now, let me uh, take you to uh, geopolitics. Uh, is the US still going to be 